Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Dundee. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Fiona Douglas and I'm the University Chaplain. The lecture tonight is a rather exciting collaboration between the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science and the University Chaplaincy. And this lecture embodies our university's strong commitment to public engagement. It's right therefore that we think this lecture is part of Dundee's Women's Festival and that the theme of the festival this year is today's women shape tomorrow's world. And really what finer speaker could we have this evening than Lady Hale to, prevent, to present this special online event? We are delighted, Lady Hale, that you are joining us. Now, before we proceed, let me go over um, just a few housekeeping matters, as we always have to do. Can I say that subtitles will not automatically be on the screen? There's a, a CC icon at the bottom of your page, which enables you to turn on the subtitles. After the lecture, there will be a short time for questions, and this will be chaired by Professor Neve Nickdade, our director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science. Now, I really have to encourage you to feel free to submit any questions you have throughout the course of the lecture, for these will be moderated and published, and we really will try to answer as many as we can. Now, we are delighted also to have our university principal, Professor Ian Lesbick, join us this evening, who will now introduce our speaker. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, and uh, it's very, very good indeed to be here. H hello, everyone. Um, I I'm sorry that we're not yet able to um, uh, see everyone. Uh, I, I think as we, we move forward uh, across the UK to come out of the COVID pandemic, the time will soon be upon us when we can uh, gather together uh, uh, in the same place and be human beings again. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted and, and genuinely privileged and honoured to be uh, uh, amongst you uh, all this evening. I think the the the, the subject of, of tonight's uh, lecture is really close to my heart, but also very close to what we're about, what the University of Dundee is about as an institution. We're an institution that exists. We, we talk about being of Dundee and for Dundee, but it's more, much more than that. We have as our absolute focus, our social purpose, making change, transforming lives, really making uh, a, a difference. And issues of inclusion, of equality, particularly gender equality are absolutely at the core of that. I'm really proud of what our university has achieved in widening access. I'm really proud of what our university is achieving an inclusion. I'm really proud of where we are going on gender equality, but it's a journey. And it's a journey we're only partly on the way through. We still have a great, great, great deal to achieve. And Lady Hill, Brenda, has been a huge, huge uh, champion advocate of gender equality. Brenda, you're, you are my niece's hero. My niece, and I should just say a, a small personal word. Um, my, 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 my niece is um, uh, a judge in the Ipswich Crown Court, and uh, she continually tells me that you have uh, really trailblazed uh, women in the judiciary. And I believe my family when, when they tell me these things. And I hope that you can trailblaze what we do in Dundee as well and continue to be the inspiration uh, that, that, that you are and that you've been for all of us and also the advocate. And, and, and I know you will do, be pushing at us to be even better uh, on gender equality because I say we are on a journey. Let me just, I've got a, a little um, uh, a description of uh, Lady Hill, which I'm going to read out because it's, it's really, it's, it's just so, in, uh, it's, it's, it's quite incredible and, and, and humbling. So as, as president of the Supreme Court, Baroness Hill served as the most senior judge in the UK 
prior to her retirement in January 2020. I suspect you're kind of partially retired, but still uh, uh, advocating for the things that you really believe in. Before becoming a judge, she worked as an academic lawyer and a barrister, as well as becoming the first woman member of the Law Commission, the first woman member of the Law Commission, a statutory body that promotes legal reform. And goodness me, there was plenty of legal reform uh, uh, to be done. She was appointed a High Court judge in 1994, was promoted to the Court of Appeal in 1999, and in 2004 became the first and only woman law lord in the House of Lords, then the Apex Court in the UK. In 2009, the law lords were translated into the Supreme Court. Baroness Hale became its deputy president in 2013 and its first woman president in 2017. Lady Hale, it's a privilege to welcome you to the University of Dundee. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. It's a delight to be with you and I wish I could be there in person, but this is much better than nothing at all, isn't it? So thank you. I know your theme is that today's women shape tomorrow's world, but I think that today's women have been shaped by the brave pioneers of the past. So I would like to look at the first women to become lawyers and judges, both north and south of the border, and to ask what we can learn from them. Scotland was, of course, something of a pioneer, but not always in a good way. It was the Scottish judiciary who first decided that women were not persons in the eyes of the law. In 1900, Margaret Strang Hall petitioned the Court of Session for the right to embark upon qualifying as a law agent. She argued that the Law Agents Scotland Act of 1873 referred to persons, and a woman was a person. Not only that, Section 4 of the Interpretation Act 1850 provided that in all acts, words importing the masculine gender shall be deemed and taken to include females, unless the contrary is expressly provided. The court took six months to decide that Miss Hall was not a person. It said, the court is authorised to admit persons, a term which, no doubt, is equally applicable to male and female. But in the case of an ambiguous term, the meaning must be assigned to it, which is in accordance with inveterate usage. Accordingly, we interpret the meaning male persons as no other has ever been admitted as a law agent. This is pretty incomprehensible, as there's nothing ambiguous about the word persons, and if there was, the Interpretation Act should have resolved it in Miss Hall's favour. In reality, the court was saying that women were disqualified from becoming lawyers by immemorial custom, and it suited the men to leave it that way. I can't resist quoting from the poem, which you may know, by Amos Chisler, published in the Glasgow Evening Times, three days after the case was decided. It's entitled Cocky Law, Is a Girl a Person? I can't do the Scottish accent, I'm afraid, but you've got to import the Scottish accent into these words. But the 13 clocking judges shook their feathers out and swore that the only kind of persons they had ever passed before were young men with shaven faces, and they could not recognise this fair lady in her laces as a person in their eyes. But the public are the judges of the judges on the bench, and the public roared with laughter at this answer to the wench. If the lawyers won't let women pick from out their well-filled bowl, better say so straight than argue that a hen is not a fowl. Great, wonderful Scots. The Court of Session's approach to the word person was, of course, vindicated by the House of Lords in another case brought by brave women pioneers from Scotland, Nairn and the University of St Andrews. It took the First World War and Parliament to put things right in the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919. Once again, a Scotswoman was the pioneer. Madge Easton Anderson was a graduate of the University of Glasgow, and had been taken on as an apprentice law agent in 1917, despite the earlier decision that women couldn't qualify. Her sponsor thought rightly that the law would soon be changed. 
She completed her apprenticeship in 1920 and graduated with an LLB degree that same year. The Society of Law Agents initially rejected her application to complete her qualifications because her apprenticeship had started before the 1919 Act was passed. But she petitioned the Court of Session, which this time took a more sympathetic view, and she was formally registered as a law agent in January 1921. So basically the first UK solicitor. The English women had to wait until 1922, when Carrie Morrison became the first to complete her articles of clerkship to become a solicitor, and Ivy Williams became the first to complete eating her dinners in an inn of court to become a barrister. So having celebrated one centenary in 1919, we in England can now celebrate another in 2022. Scotland can celebrate next year, when the centenary of Margaret Kidd becoming the first woman advocate though she had to wait a long time before being joined by a second. In 2022, we also celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first woman sitting as a judge at the Old Bailey, the world famous Central Criminal Court in London. Vincent Mulcrone in the Daily Mail was a tad patronizing. Quote, with a trace of deep crimson lipstick and only an occasional pat at her wig, the first woman judge took her seat in the Old Bailey yesterday. Generally, he was admiring. The facile verdict is that Rose Halbron has passed another feminine milestone and the courts will gain. And she smiled more than most judges do, although her smile rested on the conviction that she was about to be obeyed. That's really two questions, she smiled to defence counsel. Would you like to break it up? He was much obliged, my lady, and broke it up. Rose Halbron received a very favourable press throughout her career, which has not been the fate of all first women judges. She had brains, beauty and charm, a well-modulated speaking voice and was demonstrably good at her job, as well as being a good wife and mother. Rose was not only the first woman to sit at the Old Bailey, she was also the first woman in the United Kingdom who could properly call herself a judge. But let's track back a bit. The 1919 Act meant that women could qualify as lawyers, hold public office and eventually become judges. But although many women proved their worth as lay magistrates between the two world wars, there were no professional judges until 1945. The very first was Sybil Campbell, who'd read science and economics at Girton College, Cambridge, and then worked as an investigating officer for the Board of Trade and as an enforcement officer for the Ministry of Food during First World War. She was called to the bar in 1922, again, one of the pioneers, and practiced on the Midland Circuit. She returned to work for the Ministry of Food during the Second World War. And in 1945, she was appointed a Metropolitan Stipendiary Magistrate sitting at Tower Bridge. I believe it's significant that this appointment was in the hands of the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison. He may well have practiced a little positive discrimination as she hadn't had a large practice and controversially had been a civil servant immediately before her appointment. And she was deeply unpopular at first as her sentences were very harsh, particularly upon dockers who pilfered food in the London docks no doubt because of her Ministry of Food experience. We are told that 5,000 trade unionists marched against one of her early sentences. But she seems to have calmed down and became an enthusiastic user of probation when it was introduced in 1948. Now, nowadays, stipendiary magistrates have become district judges, open brackets, magistrates courts, close brackets, but in those days, they were not regarded as proper judges. The Lord Chancellor was responsible for the appointment of proper judges, and he was much slower to act. The first woman to preside over more serious crime at quarter sessions was Dorothy Knight Dix, who sat as deputy recorder for Deal in 1946, when the recorder was taken ill. The court ceiling fell in a short while later and people wondered whether this was an omen that women judges were bad news. She later became the third woman QC and second woman county court judge. 
The first woman to preside over civil cases in a county court was Edith Hesling, who sat as a deputy judge in Macclesfield, also in 1946, when his honour judge Raleigh Batt, and we'll come back to him, was suddenly taken ill. Both Knight Dix and Heslings sat as ad hoc deputies appointed by the local recorder or judge. They were not regular judicial appointments. Indeed, Edith Hesling was turned down as a county court judge in 1949, and the suggestion that Dorothy Knight Dix might replace Sybil Campbell as a metropolitan stipendiary magistrate in 1961 was rejected on the grounds that she would not be a safe appointment. Thus it was that the press could announce that when Rose Halbron was appointed recorder of Burnley in 1956, she was the first woman judge. In those days, quarter sessions were held in both counties and boroughs. County quarter sessions were presided over by the magistrates. They might have a legally qualified chairman, but were not bound to do so until as late as 1962. Borough quarter sessions were presided over by the borough recorder, who since 1835 was required to be a barrister of at least five years standing and was appointed by the Crown rather than the borough. However, although the Lord Chancellor would no doubt have had to approve the nomination, that nomination will probably have come from the retiring recorder and the borough. So why was Rose considered safe? It's difficult for us to grasp just what a celebrity Rose was in the 1950s. I cannot think of a barrister in recent times who has been half as famous as she was. She was born in Liverpool in 1914, the second daughter of Jewish parents. Her father ran a lodging house for passengers emigrating from Europe to North America. It was a good business. And until the Great Depression struck in the 1930s, the family were comfortably off. Rose was educated at the Belvedere School, which aimed to give girls the same academic education as boys. There she excelled academically, but also in acting and public speaking. Her mother arranged elocution lessons and she won many awards for it. This was excellent preparation for a lifetime of courtroom oratory, especially in the days when one of the loudest voiced objections to women at the bar was that their voices were too high pitched and hard to hear. She read law at U Liverpool University, graduating with first class honours in 1935. She was also the first woman to be appointed, uh, the Lord awarded the Lord Justice Holker Scholarship by Gray's Inn. This was worth the princely sum of £300 and enabled her to eat the necessary three years worth of dinners and to read for the bar exams. She was called to the bar by Gray's Inn in May 1939, but was turned down for pupillage by Professor Raleigh Batt, that same Raleigh Batt who was later to become a county court judge and ask Edith Hesling to be his deputy for a day. Although he'd been very encouraging while Rose was a law student, his excuse was that, I have a definite feeling that the other men in these chambers and the clerk would not welcome a female pupil. But she did find pupillage in another Liverpool set, starting out just as the Second World War was declared. She was busy in court as soon as she was allowed to be. No doubt some of this was because so many male barristers were away in the forces. But it wasn't the only reason. The Birkenhead News reported, Portia, 1940 version. Local history has been made this week when for the first time a woman barrister has pleaded in the Birkenhead Police Court. Only 24 years old, a dark vivacious Jewess, Miss Rose Halbron has already attracted a good deal of attention in the legal world. And after listening to her the other day, a well-known solicitor remarked to me, there's no doubt about it. To borrow a phrase from Hollywood, she will be a sensation in four or five years time. And so she was. In 1942, for example, she became the first woman to be briefed to conduct the defence in a murder trial without being led by a more senior barrister. Henry Larkin had cut his cohabitant's throat with a razor in a fit of jealous rage. Rose succeeded in obtaining a verdict of manslaughter. You may think that that was not such a good thing, but there we go. She was doing her job and obviously doing it well. 
She also appeared in many civil cases, including some which found their way into the law reports, as well as the local press, where she was becoming a household name. In 1945, the war ended and the men began to return. But Rose did not lose her practice to them. She went from strength to strength. In 1945, she also met and married Dr. Nat Burstein, a Liverpool GP. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, used to say that the most important decision she ever made was to marry Marty Ginsburg, one of those rare men who took pride in his wife's superior abilities and achievements. Nat was just the same. Their daughter, Hillary, was born in January 1949, and Rose continued to work throughout the pregnancy and returned to work within weeks of the birth. It never seemed to occur to her to give up. And in April 1949, she was one of the first two English women to be appointed King's Counsel, alongside Helena Normanton, who'd become the first woman to join an inn of court after the 1919 Act was passed. But once again, Scotland was ahead of them because Margaret Kidd had become the very first King's Counsel in 1948. Why did Rose become so famous? She was young, attractive and glamorous, but she also excelled at what she did. And a lot of what she did was to appear in famous murder trials in the days when the mandatory penalty for murder was death. Newspapers covered mur murder trials almost verbatim. Such was the public fascination. This publicity did from time to time land her in hot water with the Bar Council. In those days, barristers were not allowed to advertise or solicit work in any way. They weren't even allowed to have business cards describing themselves as a barrister. Very different these days when you look any barrister up on the internet. They're full of advertisement. They certainly weren't allowed to give interviews to the press. So Rose did have from time to time to assure the Bar Council that she had done no such thing. And the press began to speculate that she might become our first woman judge. The opportunity arose when the Criminal Justice Administration Act 1956 set permanent criminal courts along the same lines as the Old Bailey, trying the most serious crime in the region. Neville Lasky, QC, was appointed the first judge of the Liverpool Crown Court, and he'd long been a supporter of Rose having led her in a famous House of Lords case. Lasky was recorder of Burnley, and I have very little doubt that he would have been instrumental in her appointment as his successor. So for once, England was a little bit ahead of Scotland. Margaret Kidd became the first woman sheriff when she was appointed sheriff principal of Dumfries and Galloway in 1960. Rose enjoyed being a recorder and by all accounts was a success. She could sometimes spot things that the men couldn't. A pub landlord was appealing his conviction by the magistrates for serving alcohol to an underage girl. The girl turned up at court in a working dress with her hair in curlers. Women did that in the, the 1950s. Rose sent her home to put on makeup. So she returned in full makeup with her hair piled high and wearing a smart blue blouse and a tiny miniskirt. Counsel for the police gave up and the appeal was allowed. In 1962, Rose was the first woman to be appointed a commissioner of assize. This too was an ad hoc appointment as what would now be called a deputy high court judge. I'm afraid that this time, Scotland was a long way behind England. It was not until 1992 that Hazel Aronson was appointed a temporary judge in the High Court and Court of Session. By now, Rose had set her sights on becoming the first woman High Court judge, but it was not to be. Elizabeth Lane QC was appointed a County Court judge in 1962 and promoted to the High Court in 1965. She was nowhere near as famous as Rose, but she did have a successful practice and may have been regarded as a safer pair of hands. Rose joined her as the second woman on the High Court in 1974. They were both assigned to the family division, although they had both practiced in crime and civil, the work of the Queen's Bench Division. Indeed, there was a vacancy in the Queen's Bench Division when Rose was appointed, 
So why didn't Rose get it? Because there was a judge in the family division who was also very well qualified for the Queen's Bench Division and waiting for the opportunity trans to transfer. None other than Sir Tasker Watkins, VC, the wartime hero who later became the Lord Chief Justice's right hand man. He wrote to Rose, it is a pleasure to lay down my cloak before you so that you may tread without any discomfort along a path which many think should have long before been made available to you. Uh, but not so much of a pleasure that he'd forgo his chance of the Queen's bench for her. The first five women High Court judges were all assigned to the family division. But in fact, Rose didn't spend all her time there. From 1979 to 1982, she was presiding judge of the Northern Circuit, where she did Queen's bench work, including the famous Handless Corpse trial at Lancaster Castle. It wasn't until 1992 that Dame Anne Ebsworth became the first woman to be assigned direct to the Queen's Bench Division, although she was joined soon afterwards by Dame Janet Smith and Dame Heather Steele. And it wasn't until 1993 that Dame Mary Arden became the first woman to be assigned to the Chancellor Division, which deals with property, company and commercial matters. When I became the 10th woman High Court judge in 1994, the first four had retired, but of the six remaining, Five were members of the Northern Circuit, and the sixth was a daughter of the Liverpool solicitor. And we put that down to Rose. She had led the way and provided a role model for us all. She would, I am sure, be thrilled to know that, as I speak, of the 14 full time judges sitting at the Old Bailey, seven are women. 50%. The general picture is not quite so rosy. Overall, in England and Wales, about a third of court judges and a half of tribunal judges are women. But this includes a large number of fee paid part timers. The figures are not so good for full time or senior appointments. Only 29% of judges in the High Court and above are women. In Scotland, the percentage of women in the High Court and Court of Session has gone down from 29% to 26% since 2017, and of sheriffs from 23% to 22%. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has gone down from three out of 12 at the end of 2019 to only one at present. But there are two vacancies, so I do have hopes. So what lessons can we learn from the early pioneers? First, they blazed a trail which other women could follow. They didn't pull up the drawbridge after them, as some successful women have been accused of doing. Their example has led us to where we are today and where we hope to go in the future. Second, they didn't frighten the horses. Women joining a man's world have hard choices to make about how to behave. Some, like Elizabeth Lane, chose to look and sound and behave as much like a man as possible. Of course, the wig and gown makes that somewhat easier. Others, like Rose Halbron, made no secret of their femininity. She set an example to those of us who believe that we should not be shy of bringing a woman's style to the man's world. But that can be hard to do without being accused of flirtatiousness or worse. Third, it is just possible to have it all. Many women pioneers in the judiciary manage successful careers at the bar as well as being married and having children. Sybil Campbell never married. Dorothy Knight Dix was married to another QC, but I can't trace any reference to children. Edith Hesling was married and had three daughters, one of whom became a barrister, and she has a granddaughter and great granddaughter who followed suit. Rose Halbron was married and had one daughter who went on to be a successful QC specialising in commercial law. Margaret Kidd was married to a writer to the Signet and they had one daughter. Elizabeth Lane was married to another barrister and had one son. Hazel Cosgrove is married to a dentist and they have two children. Perhaps they all exemplify the greatest lesson of all. Perseverance and a good deal of luck 
we could all do with a supportive partner who's not afraid of clever women and their careers. Thank you. Thank you so very much indeed, Brenda. What a fantastic um, romp through women in the law. That has been absolutely insightful and, and a, a really, really interesting and a fascinating story. Thank you very much indeed for your, your insights and for your knowledge on that. It's drawn, as you would imagine, a number of, of different questions looking at um, the, the subject matter that you brought to us, but also some questions that are um, looking more widely at the position of the law uh, and what your thoughts are around how the law is viewed um, today. But perhaps I can start off with um, what I thought was going to be and has been a very obvious question, and that is, could you please explain to your, your audience what your brooches are that you're wearing and what do they represent to you? Ah, well, yes, I'm sorry if they're not as, as clear as they ought to be, but I thought that as this is part of your Women's Festival and the day after International Women's Day, I really ought to wear three brooches which celebrate women. Um, one of them is Equality Now, and that is um, in honour of an organisation which is called Equality Now and is fighting to use the law all over the world to secure equal rights for women. And this one is Women Unite. Um, and this one here is Courage Calls to Courage Everywhere, which is the banner which uh, the statue of Millicent Fawcett is uh, carrying, a statue in Parliament Square. Millicent Fawcett was, the, of course, the prominent suffragist, not suffragette. Yeah. So she believed in uh, trying to achieve change by peaceful means rather than by um, violence. Um, and she's the first woman to have a statue in Parliament Square. Uh, so I thought these were appropriate to wear. <laughs> Rather Fantastic. than the creature that I might otherwise have been wearing. <laughs> Fantastic. Can I, I turn you to something now about um, directly about the, the judiciary? And um, in particular, um, one of the questions has come in, which is asked is how optimistic are you? about the rule of law in this country, in the United Kingdom currently, um, and in particular um, your views on, and this might be a little controversial, but your views on um, how the government has um, perhaps not defended the judiciary um, as well as perhaps they could have done in attacks on the press and elsewhere. And what are your views around um, the the what might be perceived to be a desire to um, curtail the power of the judiciary in one sense? Well, that's a very political question. So I'm going to be a little bit guarded in, in what I say. Uh, there have been a number of things that have obviously caused some concern. One was the attack on the um, Lord Chief Justice, Master of the Rolls, and Lord Justice Sales uh, when they made the High Court decision in the first of the two big Brexit cases. This is when the Daily Mail labelled them as enemies of the people. And more worryingly, the Lord Chancellor of the day, who has a statutory duty and swears an oath to depend the independence of the judiciary, didn't instantly say, well, we have a free press. You can say what you like within the limits of the law, but it's my duty to tell you that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. They're not enemies of the people. These are judges sworn to uphold the law who are doing their best uh, to do that. And if they have got it wrong, well, then the Supreme Court will put them right. Such an easy script. Could have come out with it straight away didn't. So that was interesting. But actually lessons were learned from that and subsequently you know, she, she did react properly to the decision of the Supreme Court and subsequent Lord Chancellor um, reacted properly to the decision of the Supreme Court in the second of the two big Brexit cases. So uh, 
But on the other hand, of course, uh, there have been various mutterings which are uh, about wanting to curb the scope of judicial review, um, reviewing the Human Rights Act, and possibly uh, introducing greater political involvement in the appointment of especially Supreme Court judges. So there have been various things around. Um, the consultation and government proposals on judicial review have not led to anything very um, dramatic or troubling. Who knows what the consultation of government proposals <laughs> on the <laughs> Rights Act will lead to. Um, if the University of Dundee has put in a response, given, given its views or some organ thereof, uh, consultation closed uh, ironically yesterday. Um, but we do not know what will come of that. I don't myself think that anything much will happen with judicial appointments. Um, because the whole of the, I think mostly the judiciary are um, comfortable with the independent appointments process that we have in England and Wales, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and of course for the Supreme Court, and would be nervous about a greater political involvement in that. But who can say? So that's a rather diplomatic answer. <laughs> so there's lots to worry about, but the worry may not materialise in too much in the way of deleterious change. Thank you very much for that. And um, I, I wonder is um, thank you very much for that. And and there was a, a second question which also um, linked in a little way to, to that question, which was about uh, which you may want to touch on, um, which was about the judicial independence um, more broadly outside of the UK because of, of various challenges to judicial independence in other countries, both in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and linking to that, um, the, some of the, the, the questions are asking for perhaps what your view is around or is there uh, a, a continued sexism within the judiciary and how do you see us redressing that, that balance in the same way that 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 we have in, in as you spoke about in the appeal court where we've got a 50 50 representation from women judges how do we get there what's the journey we have to take oh well that's rather a lot of different questions yes. i should perhaps have um ended my answer to the first question <laughs> with of course um just as the price of liberty is eternal vigilance the price of the rule of law properly understood is also eternal vigilance and the price of the independence of the judiciary is eternal vigilance. So it needs civil society to speak up for the rule of law and for the independence of the judiciary. And of course, they don't always do that because they don't think it's anything to do with them until, of course, they find that they don't have an independent judiciary or the rule of law doesn't come and protect them as it should do. Um, or governments get away with things that are against the law, but nobody is there to tell them. So vigilance, vigilance, action, action is necessary. This is true worldwide. Um, there are threats to the independence of the judiciary uh, that have been particularly in Poland and Hungary um, in within uh, Europe. Uh, some of us look at the method of appointment of Supreme Court justices in the United States you know, and wonder um, how conducive that is to the independence of the judiciary. It, it's not only Supreme Court judges, it's actually federal judges in the United States. So there are endless examples of things to worry about. But the great thing about lawyers is they do worry about these things. <laughs> <laughs> and so do enough members of the press and the media. Uh, to, to mount uh, campaigns against the most damaging things. So back to what I was saying earlier. Yeah, price is vigilance and, and so on. Now, as far as um, you said sexism, mm -hmm. of course, there are two quite separate areas there because there is um, 
the continued underrepresentation of women in the judiciary and whether the judiciary itself um, engages in sexist attitudes or misogynistic attitudes, in fact. I think both of those things were you getting at, I don't know. Yeah, essentially, yes. Yeah, well, as far as the underrepresentation of women in the judiciary is concerned, uh, I mean, I'm quite hopeful because things have changed so dramatically since the days of those early pioneers. Since the day when I became a High Court judge in 1994, uh, things have changed um, out of all recognition. And although we say you know, 29 percent in the High Court and above is not enough, it's hugely better than it was. Uh, and if we look at the uh, lower ranks of the judiciary and particularly tribunal judges where it's at 50 percent, well, then uh, women are increasingly represented. And I love it when I go to meetings of the UK Association of Women Judges and I'm surrounded by these wonderful, sassy young women from my point of view, <laughs> you know, uh, who, who don't look at all like judges, but they are judges and doing a great job in many different courts and tribunals around the country. So I think we've made progress, that we're making progress and the introduction of the independent judicial appointment systems has helped that. Um, Definitely, uh, because it has replaced what used to be the old tap on the shoulder system. And the trouble with a tap on the shoulder system is that you have to know whose shoulders to tap. And so you're fishing in a very limited pool and you tend to apply your usual assumptions to fishing in those limited pools. So the new system has made a, a difference, I think. Um, and we can continue to be hopeful about it. And people think it's a problem. You know, the figures that I quoted from Scotland, uh, were in the context of people thinking it was a problem mm -hmm. you know, that they'd gone slightly down, um, whereas they wouldn't have thought it was a problem 20 years ago. So, so I, am, I am quite hopeful. Um, I, I think we've made progress and it will continue. As far as um, much more general problem of sexism or misogyny, in the um, it's in the application of the law it's not in the law itself you know, um, most of our laws are pretty good uh, it's in the way in which they are applied uh, and this is particularly true of complaints of sexual exploitation violence violence and abuse of women and girls which is still not adequately addressed by the system. Um, and that, of course, it starts with the police and their attitudes. We've all heard some horrendous stories of police attitudes, um, which if it were just a few bad apples, it wouldn't be such a problem. But some of us are worried that it's not just a few bad apples. But uh, we've. Um, found that the Crown Prosecution Service, and I expect the Procurators Fiscal are no different, do take quite a cautious attitude to bringing, so that even if the police charge somebody, the CPS doesn't necessarily uh, pursue the matter. And then we find that juries are very difficult to persuade of guilt in certain sorts of case, uh, whatever the quality of the evidence. Um, and so I think it's the application of the laws by the people who are charged with enforcing them, mm -hmm. which to some extent includes the judges, but I think probably the, the problems are much more severe uh, at, at the grassroots of the, uh, of the system than they are in the judiciary. But no doubt we can still have examples of judges who um, think the wrong thing or say the wrong things. Um, but we can educate judges. It's much more difficult to educate um, other players in the game. That's a re really, really interesting. And um, I, I'm going to finish on two questions, if I may. Um, one is, and it's, it's related, I think, to, uh, to the point you've just made, and that is um, across our university, we take, uh, as our principal said at the beginning, um, we 
are, are really invested in equality and in diversity and in inclusion. And we have um, in each of our different schools, we have um, leaders and champions for these matters that um, work not just with staff, but with our students. What, what do you think we can be doing better as educators that help to move forward that, that agenda and help to educate our young people, our colleagues, but also our public to try to get those juries in particular to, uh, to get on board with what you're saying? Yes. I'm not arrogant enough, you know, to think that it's for me to tell a university what it should be doing um, and what it should be doing better. Um, because I think you have to start with a commitment to doing what you're trying to do and, uh, and voicing that commitment. Um, and you know, the one thing that I think in other contexts is quite important and we haven't talked enough about is inclusion. Mm -hmm. So we talk about diversity and we talk about, yes, let's widen the pool, let's uh, have a much more diverse uh, group of students, researchers and staff in a university or wherever. And that can sometimes be done. But of course, it doesn't work unless the people that you have recruited feel comfortable and included in the community. Uh, and valued for their diversity, rather than made to feel that they've got to conform. Um, so I think that's the thing that all institutions have got to cope with. You know, when, when women, I had a wonderful story about, uh, from, from a woman judge sitting in, I won't tell you where, um, and who uh, probably mentioned something about the UK Association of Women Judges, but anyway, the uh, the resident judge, the, the chief judge, I suppose the sheriff principal, basically equivalent in that court said, well, I don't think any of the women who come and sit in this court could complain that they haven't been treated as one of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Point made. <laughs> yes, I thought it just summed it up. Um, and that sort of thing. You know, can happen. And as I was saying, you know, with women judges, they do have this problem of whether they try and behave like one of the boys or whether they um, uh, pr take pride in their um, femininity, which has the risk that they'll then be accused of um, you know, trading on it. Nobody accused Rose of trading on her mm -hmm. femininity, but she was very obviously a woman and a very good looking woman and a very nice sounding woman. Um, and uh, I think that that's what women should do because then people are much more used to women's ways of behaving and presenting and don't think of them as being flirtatious or whatever. They think of them, oh, that's 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 a woman. Good. <laughs> you know, just as a man is a man. Good. Uh, so it is that inclusiveness and just another aspect of this. Um, I don't know if you north of the border, you take the slightest interest in um, the Yorkshire Cricket Club. <laughs> um, you may not. After all, cricket is not your sport, really. And um, Yorkshire is not in Scotland, although uh, as a Yorkshire woman myself, I do think that Yorkshire people are as close to being Scots as any English. Uh, but Anyway, there was a uh, uh, a cricketer, very good cricketer, of Pakistani heritage, um, who uh, played with with the Yorkshire Cricket Club for some time, but eventually left and spoke out about the. Um, banter to which he had been subjected, which of course he perceived as being racist um, language and jokes, you know, and slurs. Uh, the people doing it probably didn't 
think anything of it. You know, they probably just thought, well, you know, we insult one another in various ways and this is how we're going to insult this chap. Um, but they also were treated him differently from other colleagues when one of his, his, his a baby died, his baby died. This is a very good example of not including. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not trying to look at things from the point of view of somebody whom you want there, partly for their own diversity, for heaven's sake, you know, Yorkshire is full of uh, uh, excellent cricketers of uh, South uh, Asian heritage. But there we go. So that's all I would say. Um, as I say, I'm not so arrogant that I want to give advice to a university <laughs> how it should behave. And my final question before I hand over um, to to Aaron McGuinness, who's one of our law students who's going to do a vote of thanks, is what advice would you give to to young people um, studying law um, and particularly young women studying law um, or young or old women studying law who, yes. um, who are are what advice would you give them to to look towards their futures um, in law in, in, in this country? Well, actually, the the profession in England and Scotland, they're really quite different. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't want to be arrogant enough to um, say that I'm presuming to tell Scots women how they should behave. But what I tend to say uh, to, to students, um, the first thing is, enjoy your studies. You won't enjoy it all because there are bits of law which are really boring and tedious or difficult, uh, but find some that you enjoy and enjoy as much as you possibly can uh, because if you enjoy your studies you'll work hard at them and if you work hard at them you'll be the best you possibly can at them. And that's a virtuous circle <laughs> because if you don't enjoy what you're doing you won't work hard and you won't be the best you can. So it's a vicious circle. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing I would say is be the best you can at what you're currently doing and then take any interesting opportunity that comes your way, even if it is slightly not what you expected, not what you were planning, but it seems like an interesting thing to do. Um, I was I had my shoulder tapped to become a part time um, Crown Court and County Court judge in 1982. After I had been away from the bar for 10 years and a university teacher. Now, so that was quite a scary sort of proposition. And I could have said, no, I don't want to do that. I'll concentrate on my academic career. I, I think you know, it will be a distraction if I try and do the judging. Um, but I thought, no. That's an exciting thought. <laughs> yeah, I've no idea whether I'll be any good at it or whether I can do it, but I'm going to say yes. So I would recommend all people. And I think the third thing that goes along with that is it's fine to have goals, ultimate goals. That's OK. But don't feel that you've been a failure or in any way uh, have behaved wrongly or made the wrong choices if you're deflected from them and go down a different path because there are so many paths down which lawyers can go. So many different law jobs, many of which law students won't know about or think about and yet some of them are really really fascinating. I think being lead general counsel for the Bank of England must be a brilliant job and that's a woman. Um, so it's just loads of examples like that. Uh, so those are the three things I'd say. Fantastic. Thank you so much for great advice. And with that, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's questions, but I think we covered most of what was asked. And with that, uh, very uh, pleased to hand over to Erin, um, who's one of our law students, who's going to give uh, a vote of thanks. Over to you, Erin. Good evening everyone, uh, thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Um, my name is Erin and I am a second year law student who's been heavily involved with the promotion of diversity, equality and inclusion within law, especially at Dundee. 
I hope you have all enjoyed this informative, thought provoking presentation and question answer session tonight. It's now my honour to and privilege to give the vote of thanks to all those who have helped make this event happen. We would not be here today if it were not for the fantastic work of the Leverhulme Research Centre uh, for Forensic Science, as well as the school chaplaincy. So I would first like to thank both organisations for the planning and running of this event. Next, I would like to give a massive thank you to Lady Hale for giving up her time to speak to all of us today. With it having been International Women's Day yesterday and the Dundee Women's Festival continuing to run, where we are celebrating the path to women's equity, it, I, do not, uh, I could not think of a better speaker to share their experiences. I think it's fair to say that Lady Hale is a huge inspiration to all women in the field of law, specifically the upcoming generation of lawyers and students dubbing her the Beyonce of law for her role of empowering women and influential impact <laughs> uh, that she has had on all of our lives. Having exemplified breaking the glass ceiling, uh, be it becoming the first uh, woman appointed to the Law Commission or the first woman of justice and later president of the Supreme Court, where she has not only been a voice for women, but all minorities who have uh, lacked voice in history previously. She has helped everyone see that women uh, uh, can and deserve a space at the table in the legal field. So it's been a complete honour for us to get to hear her speak today. I thought it was especially powerful going through the history of women in law, starting with uh, Madge Easton, Easton Anderson, uh, to see how far we have come in the past century and also to se celebrate the fantastic achievements of all of these role models who fought so hard to get to where we are today. And thank you also for the advice that you've given to all our students on their bright careers ahead of them. I will definitely uh, keep hold of this through my studies and my legal career, as I'm sure many others will also. Thank you to everyone for taking the time to be here today and listening to everyone speak. I hope you have a great week and get the chance to see what other events are on at the Dundee uh, Women's Festival uh, throughout the week. I will now pass you back to Fiona and Neve for some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Erin. It means the world to have one of you, our students, give this vote of thanks. It just sets everything in context and makes it truly inspirational start to finish. Thank you. All that's left to say, we've, we've thanked everyone. Thank you again. Wonderful evening. Um, inspirational, full of wisdom and wit and everything else. It's our intention and our hope to um, present other lectures in the future, so please watch this space. Can I just remind you before we say goodnight, if you are able to fill in our online evaluation form after the event, because we find this very helpful in our future planning. Thank you everyone again on behalf of Neve and myself and everyone else. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Brenda, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>